So we're going to wait about five minutes to get everybody, make sure everybody's in before we get started. Dave, were you ready? Yes, I think a big yes. I have faith in everybody here. I feel like silence is <laughs> taking over this class. Okay, let's wait five minutes and then we'll get back to starting the class when everybody's in, okay? Okay, in the meantime, uh, Dave, who's going to be um, having presentation rights from your group? Brian? Okay, let me just go ahead and set that up. And then you can just start. <laughs> oh, thank God I don't count that. <laughs> well, I do if it was on the presentation. Wow. So, okay, let me make you, okay, so Brian, you're a presenter now, so you can set yourself up. Uh, you still have about maybe five, six minutes before we get started. I just want to, I'm still going to go through, you know, the whole spiel like I do every week. Uh, right now, I'm just getting your group's name. Is everybody in your group here today, right now, so far? Or are you guys still waiting on people? They and Brian. Am I muted? Oh. I'll just speak. Um, I think <laughs> Sanjeev is missing, but there he is. Uh, he's coming in. Yeah. Just joining. So your group has Sanjeev. Uh, last name for Sanjeev is Bas Basnet. Oh, that's close to my first name. Basnet. They always make mistake about my last name. Um, my first name called me Beth, not, I don't know why. Yeah. Uh, Brian Samuel. There we go. Samuel G. And Hong Lin. Hong Lin is here as well. Excellent. Okay. So um, let's just wait a couple more minutes and then we'll get started, okay? But you can start setting uh, setting up your, you know, sharing your screen and everything if you'd like, if you're ready. And I am just going to go through 10 minutes in about one minute. William, I haven't said anything yet. I haven't called anybody's name, but thank you. I'll, I'll still be calling your name probably when I get there.
Okay, so I'm going to start going through attendance. Um, Michael Amanasar. Arafat. I have some people missing today. We have tests tomorrow. Uh, Hassan. Hi. Brian, can you just mute just for a minute? Uh, Sajid's here. No, you can still share. Just mute your mic. Mic. Oh my God. Um, Sebastian. Sebastian. Thank you. Uh, Jerwin. Thank you. Uh, Harshal. Okay, thank you. They will scope forces here. William is here. And Raymond. Yeah. Bill Gunn. Okay. <clears throat> Raymond's here. Okay. Zero. Thank you. Hey. Um, Gabriel. Not here. Samuel is here. Ivan. Not here. Brian is here. B. EJ. Ifani. Which one do you prefer, Ifini or EJ? Which one? Anyway, so I called you with EJ. You still didn't answer, so I didn't know. Okay, Hongwei. Uh, Sadik. <laughs> Honglin, you always do this. I don't know why. <laughs> Oh God. Uh Sadi, are you here? It's you, Hongwe, yes. No one can spell today. Okay. <laughs> Ram. Ram. Okay. Uh Michael McDowell. Thank you, Trong. Thank you. Hong Lin, I know you're here because you already said you're here. And you're in the group, so you must be here. Valeria? Not here. Asya? Not here. Hassan Safwan? Reniku? Hi, thank you. Um, and Carla? Here. Shabham. Here. James. Thank you. Prem. Nope. Claudia. Not here. Kiefer. Not here. Ray Fong. Ray Fong, sorry. Hayden, thank you, and Lushui, definitely not last, last but not least, okay, okay, excellent, so if I didn't call your name, I know, I said that, thank you, so if I didn't call your name, or if you came in after I might, might have called your name, please let me know you're here, um, Okay. Oh, you're here. I, I did write you down, Raymond. You're good. Um, Claudia, thank you. Okay. So, um, are you guys ready to present? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, uh, after class, you guys, after the presentation, everybody, you guys are going to do the question, uh, you know, the Q&A. And then after that, if uh, we don't have any questions, and if we don't have any questions about the project, we're going to end the session for 
um, this evening. Okay. Mm -hmm. You guys can still work on your project on your own. Um, so I give the mic to Brian. Good luck guys. Okay. I'm going to meet myself now. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sam. Thank you for uh, attending this uh, class today. Our group's presentation today is all about an overview of pre-tensioned and post-tensioned beams and girders. Um, yes. Uh, first, uh, we need to talk about what pre-test concrete is. We know that concrete in itself is strong against compressive forces and weak against tension. Uh, with this, reinforcement is cast in the concrete to address this issue. However, uh, free, uh, reinforced concrete in, is just one form of concrete that answers a certain type of problem in construction. Um, unlike reinforced concrete, pre-stressed concrete addresses loads typically found on long horizontal structures like bridges. When compared to reinforced concrete, as shown in this uh, image over here, uh, typical reinforced concrete is still uh, relatively prone to uh, deflection when loaded. It produce, produces cracks uh, at the, on the underside of the beam. Pre-stressed concrete prevents this through the use of tendons, which consists of a steel single wire, uh, multi-wire strands or threaded bars. Uh, that are typically placed on the tension side of the concrete. And these are tensioned within the range of stresses enough to resist the design load while retaining its elasticity. This process induces an initial compressive force to the concrete to resist uh, the tensile forces and ultimately um, improves its serviceability. And since the concrete will be under constant stress, a special mix of aggregate and high strength cement is used for its production. Next slide, please. So next, uh, we have two types of pre-stressed concrete. One is uh, pre-tensioned concrete, and the other one is post-tensioned concrete. The difference between the two is the time when the tendons are placed relative to when the cement mix cures. So for the pre-tensioned concrete, the tendons, uh, typically threaded bars, are positioned and then tensioned between abutments and pulled by a jack. Then forms are assembled into place covering the tendons before that cement mix is poured. Once the cement cures to its desired strength, the ends of the tendons are uh, finally uh, severed or cut. Uh, that's basically uh, pre-tensioning. And for post-tensioning or post-tension concrete, the, co the concrete member is formed with a sleeve, a sheath or a duct. And this uh, sheath uh, serves as a path for the tend to be inserted through the concrete. Uh, so before tensioning, anchors are installed on both ends. Uh, so that the tendons will stay in place uh, while it's being stretched by a jack. After achieving the desired stress, the tendons are cut at the ends and grout is pumped into the duct or sheath and allowed to harden, keeping the tendons in place, uh, which is basically post-tensioning. Thank you. Now I will pass to Brian for his slides.
Hi, everybody. Um, so I am going to explain what a bridge girder is. Um, the girder is a longitudinal bridge element that supports the deck slab um, carrying all the external loads and transmitting them to substructure elements like bearings, abutments, and cross beams. Um, it's essentially what carries the roadway um, and everything about it um, and takes all of those uh, loads and passes them down to um, the ground. Um, the bridge girders have two main functions. They carry the load of main traffic on the deck and they also serve um, to reduce deflection uh, for pedestrians' um, uh, comfort. Um, they're, they're designed to, um, to not flex. Um, so just a little bit about how the design of a pre-stressed bridge beam um, works. Um, I don't know where my video went there. There it is. Um, I'm just going to play this little video. Um, this is from a, a company that uh, produces bridge girders and beams, um, and it was a very good explanation. Um, as to the design process of um, of the beams. So the design of a pre-stressed, precast bridge beam will vary, of course, depending on the type of structure the beams are used in, on, and the type of loads, also the type of codes that you're required to use. However, there are certain typical steps which we'll touch on just briefly today. The first step in the design of any structural element, of course, is to define what loads does that beam, that structural element, need to carry. Once we define those loads, then we are able to produce the load effects. Moment and shear principally are what we're concerned about with regard to bridge beams. Now, it is critically important with precast, pre-stressed bridge beams to distinguish between the loads that will be carried by different section properties. So the self-weight of the beam and the weight of any in-situ concrete that will be poured on top of the beam will be carried by the beam alone. That needs to be, those loads and load effects need to be separated from the loads that will be carried by the beam acting compositely with the slab above it or the infill concrete between the beams. The other loading type, the other step of bridge beam design for loads that is slightly unusual for other structural elements is you need to define the load effects, specifically the stresses, that will result from differential shrinkage and also from differential temperature. Once you've defined the loads and typically create an analytical model wherein you draw out the load effects, the moments and the shears, 
we can move on then with designing the preset, pre-stressing strand layout and also the links that are required to accommodate the load effects. Generally speaking, the strand layout, the pre-stressing strand layout, the magnitude of force applied, the, the number of strands required, the same magnitude of force is always applied to a specific strand. That does not vary. But the total number of strands required and the position, the location of those strands is typically determined by the stress limit check phase of the design. The stress limit check phase of the design essentially sets a compressive stress limit and a tensile stress limit, which frequently is zero, no tensile stress. And the cumulative stress that you will calculate from the pre-stress itself that's applied, the moment resulting from the eccentricity of the pre-stress, and also the moments applied to the beam, that cumulative added summed stress must fall within the stress limits. That is the first and critical stage of the design of pre-stress concrete bridge beam and frequently governs the strand layout that is required. However, the critical component of pre-stress design as well is the loss of pre-stress. The loss of pre-stress essentially occurs because what is fundamental to pre-stressing is we stretch out the pre-stressing strands. Concrete is cast around in pre-tensioning for pre-cast beams and the strands are released, thereby applying the compression to the beam and the moment. Now, those strands Think of it, a crude analogy essentially would be a bungee cord. When you stretch out a bungee cord, and if you allow the ends of that bungee cord to move ever slightly towards each other, you will lose some of the force in the cord. So it's similar to pre-stressing strand. We stretch them out, we release, apply the, the stress, the force to the, to the beam, but that force will cause the beam to shrink. Will not to shrink, it'll cause the beam to compress slightly, the ends to move that strain in the beam will cause a loss of pre-stress in the strands themselves. Similarly, Okay, um, that's far as that needs to go. Um, so what they were talking, what he was talking about was the um, losses in, in this, uh, uh, due to um, the release of the, the tension in the, the beam. Um, additionally, once all of that is done, there is a, uh, an ultimate limit state check um, that usually um, really just a check. Um, usually there's no design changes necessary at that point. Um, and additionally, as part of the design, um, there's a shear design check um, to put shear links in as well as a torsion design check um, to make sure that as um, because there's eccentric loads um, placed on the beams from vehicles driving, um, that there's no twisting in the beams. Okay, so I will pass it on to, I believe it's Dewu. Can everybody hear me? Okay. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Okay, okay thank you, Brian. Um, can you go next slide?
Okay, so for, before I explain the pretension quadrant, we need to uh, watch the video about the pretension, the pretension quadrant and post quadrant uh, production process. Can you play the, this YouTube to post? Step one, install socket firmware. Step two, install side firmware. Step three, install reinforcement. Step four, install bar share for tendon profile. Step five, installation for force tension duct. Step six, push strand into duct and install anchor plate with spiral reinforcement. Step 7, complete install of every tender. Step 8, complete site firmware. Step 9, complete end of firmware. Step 10, concrete team. Step 11, install anchor head and weight. Step 12, dressing. Step 13, cut the end of strand. Step 14, install anchor ground cap. Step 15, grouting. Step 16, remove grout cap. website for free and getting the guidance is
Next, please. Next. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, pretension girdle, which is uh, one of the precast concrete types. First of all, the pretension concrete girdle is completed in the factories. Therefore, it is uh, suitable for precast construction works like an accelerated bridge construction. And fabricate concrete girdle has more reliable and durable quality than cast in place concrete. Second, uh, pretension, uh, pretension concrete girdle is preferred when the small structure element or similar sections are used. And then it is too difficult to place the curved strand in the concrete. So pretension girdle concrete girdle pretension and concrete girdle only forms a straight line shape. Last but not least, uh, pretension concrete girdle is cheaper than post-tension girdle because bearing anchorage system is not involved in concrete, such as duct, bearing end plate, and grout port. Next, please. Uh, there are many types of pretension girdle edge shapes. Uh, just I will explain a few typical types of pretension girdle. First girdle is CPCI I girdle. This shape is, looks uh, the letter I. I girdle is the most common concrete girdle types. And CPCI I girdle is a standard side, guide, uh, standard side girdle known to op optimize cost and maintenance. CPCI I girdle has the large spacing, so it is possible to use around three meter spacing. Uh, the span, um, the span of CPCI I girdle is commonly used from nine meter to thirty-seven meter, and then depth to the span ratio is from nine uh, five to six percent. However, uh, when the girder sets the pier, we must consider the deflection or twist of the girder because it is long span and slender. When you look at the left picture, image one, it is a practical case of CPCI girder in Highway 11 Bridge, North Bay, Ontario. Next, please. Um, CPCI box girder is one or multiple closed shells that are acting in bending. Such girders are used for foot bridges, railway bridges, and highway bridges. If this girder is applied, it is possible to use shallow superstructure thickness. Based on the shape of the box, it has high torsional uh, stiffness and strength. It is available for CPCI box girder to be used for the common long span bridge, which span is from 34 meter to 64 meter. Depth to span ratio is 4.5 to 6 percent. The image one on the left side shows the box girder were applied to Ingerhart River Bridge in Charlton, Ontario. Uh, next, please. The next is uh, the double tick concept employs precast segment construction technology, which allows a uh, bridge to be built rapidly with uh, minimal impact to the traffic. Unlikely, I order. Uh, double tick order doesn't need the slab with cast in place concrete. So, shallow superstructure thickness can be used. The girder shape can be used beautiful and flexible design. Therefore, it can apply to the bridge as well as the roof or floor of the building. The girder span is 12 meter to 27 meter, 
and depth to span ratio is 5.5 to 6 percent. Double T girder bridge concerns deck longitudinal cracks. As a, as a connection point between double T girders are created longitudinal along the traffic flow. flow. Any lateral movement of double T girders can cause the load surface to crack longitudinally. So to, redu to, so, to reduce this, uh, these problems, many methods uh, have been developed to manage the lateral connection of double T girders. Uh, the material used in the connections are baker rods, steel bars, welded plates, and grouts. When you look at uh, image one, uh, this picture is uh, demonstrate the completed double T girder bridge, which is the uh, Iroquois Cranberry Marsh Road Bridge over Highway 400 in Ontario. Next, please. Um, this is NUI girder. When you look at the image two, NUI girder has the wide top flange and wide and thick bottom flange. The wide and thick bottom flange allows more pre-stressing strength and resistance to increase the load of longer spans. Moreover, the wide top flange provides the better worker platform and shorter deck slab spans. This is design in a, uh, this design um, enables the girder to use the longer span. The span is commonly uh, 20, 22 to 60 meter and the depth to span ratio is 5.5 to 7.5 meter. According to CPCI, NUI girder has broken the span record at the 65 meter span in South Calgary. The image one shows NUI girder bridge for highway 417 extension in Ontario. Next, please. Uh, this is the last slice for pretension girder. Ideally, I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, introduce interesting research about covered pretension girder. I explained that the pretension, pretension girder is seldom used for the curved bridge in the overview of pretension girder. When the cover, when the, when curved bridge are constructed, steel girders or post-tension box girders are applied to the bridge. Only Netherlands has the experience of the curved pretension box girder, box concrete girder. Engineers have studied the curved pretension eye girder to be potentially more cost effective, cost effective than uh, curved steel, than the curved, uh, curved steel girder and curved post tension concrete girder. At the, at the first experimental study, they studied the geometry of the curvature and lift issue and fabrication for pretension beam. And then, this is theory applies to NUI girder. As a result, it is feasible to fabricate pretensioned girder along the curvature, and it is possible it is possible that the span range of curved girder is extended using the uh, existing splicing and post tensioning technique. Moreover, in terms of in, uh, more in terms of cost. Pre-tension eye girder can save 30% of cost less than post-tension eye girder. And thank you. And Sanji will explain post-tension eye girder. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'll be covering post-tension girder. Um, next slide, please. Um, as uh, mentioned before, the uh, compared to a normal uh, reinforced concrete, where uh, it is a passive kind of reinforcement, uh, pre-stressing allows the reinforcement on within the concrete to 
be uh, put under tension before it is put under service. Uh, this means that the concrete can do uh, its job of bearing compression as soon as the load is applied and before the deflection starts to happen. Uh, although there are two ways of to pre-stress concrete structures, I'll just be covering the post-tensioning on this presentation. Uh, the main difference between pre-tensioning and post-tensioning is that in the case of post-tensioning, uh, uh, pre-stressing of steel tendons is done after the concrete has hardened and uh, gained sufficient strength. Uh, this allows some flexibility into where the post-tensioning can be done. So it can be done in the construction site as well as the factory. Um, Post-tensioning is the uh, earliest form of pre-stressing. So it was uh, pioneered by a guy named uh, Eugene Fresinet in France in uh, 1930s. And the first application of post-tensioning was done in a uh, marine terminal in France in uh, 1933. Next slide, please. Uh, there are many advantages to post-tensioning. The, uh, the main one is that it allows for design flexibility. Uh, with uh, post-tensioning, uh, bridges can be built under demanding geometry requirements, like uh, having complex curves, variable super elevation, and uh, noticeable grade changes. Uh, it also allows uh, architectural freedom because structures can have uh, creative designs without losing function. Um, Post-tensioning is the preferred method of uh, pre-stressing in large projects uh, where large, um, uh, large uh, and heavier structural elements are required because uh, it allows for extremely long spans to be built while uh, significantly reducing the materials use for the same amount of strength and stiffness. Uh, as a result, uh, materials and transportation costs and the uh, amount of manpower needed can be significantly reduced. Um, longer spans also means that uh, we don't need as much as the intermediate supports or columns. Uh, in case of bridges, um, over rivers, we're not diverting or disrupting the river, so we have a reduced impact on the environment. Uh, Post-tensioning has also been used to retrofit or strength, uh, strengthen uh, aging infrastructure. Uh, one of the things to note though is that post-tensioning requires the use of sheathing. Um, next slide, please. Um, the basic element of uh, post-tensioning is called a tendon. Uh, Post-tensioning tendon is uh, made up of uh, one or more piece, pieces of pre-stressing steel. Uh, multiple strands of steel tendons, multiple strand steel tendons are usually used in bridges. Uh, multiple strand meaning that uh, multiple multiple pieces of steel strands make up a tendon. Uh, tendon is then coated in a protective coating of either grout or grease and uh, housed inside a duct or sheathing. Um, you can see the duct uh, in the uh, bottom left corner of uh, corner picture or the top, top left picture. The, uh, the difference in the type of protective coating used differentiates the amount of uh, different differences the type of post tensioning uh, during pre stressing uh, hydraulic jacks are used to tension the uh, tendons which are then anchored to the each end to transmit the forces into through the concrete structures uh, next slide please uh, there are two major types of post tensioning uh, bonded and unbonded in uh, bonded post-tensioning, after the steel is uh, stretched uh, and uh, is anchored into the ends, the uh, sheathing or the duct that houses the uh, tendon is uh, filled with uh, 
kind of grout, uh, which uh, bonds the tendon to the concrete. Uh, this type of post tension is commonly used in bridge construction. In unbonded type of post tensioning, grease is used as a protective coating. This means that the steel tendon is free to move longitudinally relative to the concrete. Uh, the, uh, the, in comparison, bo bonded post tensioning has much uh, lower reliance on the anchorage because the bonded tendons are uh, connected to the surrounding concrete along the full length with a uh, grout. Uh, bonded tendons also provide better strength in flexure and provide a better crack control. Unbonded tendons, uh, on the other hand, they have the ability to be prefabricated off-site uh, leading to faster installations and uh, better flexibility. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the other is uh, external unbonded. This type of post tensioning is used to strengthen aging bridges or other concrete structures because uh, the unbonded tension are installed on the outside of the concrete structures instead of side, which allows uh, it to be maintained or uh, replaced. You can see the picture of the uh, this type of external bone uh, post, post tensioning on the uh, left picture. Um, next slide, please. These are the other kinds of applications for post tensioning. Uh, post tensioning allows for aesthetically pleasing architecture. So here we see a um, a stadium uh, which are uh, built for to have large open spaces and uh, to be pretty to look at. So uh, and have have to have a uh, uh, they have extremely variable uh, live loads. So. Uh, post tensioning allows uh, the architects and uh, engineers to achieve that. Uh, the middle picture shows a uh, um, kind of a uh, commercial space. Uh, the large, uh, you, the availability of uh, big floor space is a, uh, is a, uh, need for in that kind of scenario. Uh, the the last picture shows the inside of a tower, um, wind tower. Uh, you see the uh, tendons going all around the uh, the outs the inside of the um, um, cross section there. Um, this is to uh, work against the uh, wind that could be coming from any, any side. Uh, the tendons all around, they provide a uniform compressive stress against any lateral rows, which could be wind or uh, uh, seismic loads. Uh, this concludes my presentation. Uh, hi again, guys. Um, now here is a simple step-by-step -step process of using girders on a three span bridge. Next slide, please. Um, first, of course, the, the girders should be delivered on to the site. Uh, these are transported by a uh, an extendable flatbed truck, uh, like this one in this image. And uh, the girders uh, should be stored in the site sitting upright this is to prevent uh, damage uh, to the girders. Um, next, uh, once they are uh, ready, the first set of girders will be erected on the first span of the bridge, uh, as shown in this image. Typically, uh, cranes are used for this kind of job, and uh, lifting hooks uh, near the ends of the girders allow the allow the cranes to attach their hoists to position and uh, guide 
uh, the girders in place. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in this image, um, images, the ends of the girders are placed on the bearing pads of uh, the abutment on the left image and the pier on the right image. So uh, that's a, a typical placement of uh, the girders. Uh, next slide, please. So after uh, completing the preliminary elements, uh, like the uh, concrete deck slab, uh, for the first pan bridge, crane, cranes are now able to uh, move forward and uh, deliver and position the the next set of girders onto the middle span of the bridge. Uh, and once the middle span is complete, uh, the same procedure is done uh, for the final span of the bridge. And finally, forming the parapet wall, installation of the handrail, and the asphalt pavement, uh, paving of the road surface will be done at the last part of the construction. So that's a simple step-by-step um, you know, -step procedure of using uh, girders on a typical bridge. So I'll pass it on to um, Hong Lin. Uh, hi, uh, uh, please, uh, next, next slide. Uh, I want to show, so uh, we have an example of bridge. More recently used the pro-tension concrete and post-tension concrete. Uh, this slide is show Highway 11 McLevery Creek crossing, no spade, Ontario, a highway with a covered 30 kilometer south of North Bay was reconstructed or reached to build a bridge using protection concrete girders. The girders are special because it has in target deck slab when it's a product. This project was Ontario's first achievement in equating all girder of bridge with this span is only one day. The bridge is owned by the Minister of Transportation of Ontario and the contractor was Anchor Construction. The supplier of the girder was the DCK LTD. The bridge was completed last year, 2020. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is Highway 407, Brown Creek Crossing, Bremerton, Ontario. The Highway 407 has a bridge system over Brompton Creek Valley in Brenton. The bridge consisted of two separate structures supported on common abutment, but with the independent piers. The girder used for this are bombed the post tension the concrete. The bridge is owned by Highway 407 Inter. The girder was supplied by Procom Inc. and was completed in 2001. Thanks. So uh, that ends our presentation. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. And uh, we're open for your questions now. Thank you very much, guys. Okay. Um, is there any questions for our group here? Here we go. Trong is ready. <laughs> okay. How is pre-tension girder suitable for Canadian weather? I was going to ask that. <clears throat> well, similar to it. So, who can answer him? How is pre-tension girder suitable for Canadian? Hello. Well, uh, um, pre-tension girders 
um, well, it's true that uh, thermal uh, stress is uh, significant in uh, the climate of Canada. Sorry, and, repeat that. Well, it, it is true that the uh, uh, Canadian climate is uh, very extreme for uh, when it comes to thermal uh, you know, stresses. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah. I, unfortunately, we haven't, uh, uh, as for me at least, I, I haven't uh, read on this. Okay, is there anybody in the group that can answer that? Uh, I don't think that we did any research on specific to Canadian winters. Uh, I would say that that. Um, okay, did you do it on based on Canada? Because that was the whole main goal of um, doing it for Canada, right? Right. No. Okay. Okay. So we'll leave that for now. Uh, EJ, um, can pre-stressing be used for slabs and columns? Uh, yes, uh, pre-stressing can be used for slabs and columns. Uh, uh, in one uh, example that uh, Sanjeev uh, showed earlier, you saw a uh, a very uh, lengthy overhang of a commercial uh, structure. Uh, those labs are pre-stressed so that uh, uh, just to achieve certain what call this um, cantilever forces. Okay, thank you. And so, and then next, Hassan, I think I'm just going to ask you. Uh, what cons are for what technology? What what technology are you referring to? Pre and post. Okay, so yes, we we saw a lot of uh, pros and we didn't see the cons. So, is there any cons that you came across for pre and post uh, tensioning? Uh, the cost, uh, I think, is the, the con for this type of uh, uh, technology. It's mm -hmm. uh, This technology is very expensive and uh, tedious. Uh, the production itself is uh, meticulous also. Okay. And uh, yeah, unlike uh, your typical reinforced concrete, it's very step-by-step. Uh, you know, is there anyone other than Samuel that can answer these questions? Uh, actually, pretension concrete is uh, created in the in the factory, so it is uh, it has the advantage of pretension concrete girder has is uh, the the, the much uh, much reliable quality. So they can control the material quality of uh, uh, of the girders. Uh, however, the pretension girder can make the curved bridge, curved curved shapes. So that's why it is one of the uh, disadvantage of the pretension girder. However, the pretension girder is a little bit expensive than uh, more expensive than the pretension girder because they use some anchorage system to 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 set the tenders after setting the this girder. However, but the post tension girder can the post tension the box girder can use the uh, curved bridge like uh, when the when when the bridge have some 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 long long radius of the curvature can mm -hmm. can make the base can make this kind of bridge. So it is one of the advantage of post tension girder. Thank you. 
Thank you. Okay, so um, you were talking about, they, you were saying about the, um, and I'm not sure if I missed it or not, for the box girders, um, I saw that there was in Netherlands. Is there one, the curve pretension box girders? It was Netherlands. Do you have any examples in Canada or in Ontario? In COVID pretension girder, you mean? The 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 curve, yeah, the pretension box girder. Oh you no, know, I don't have this example. Okay, we, sorry, okay. sorry about it. Yeah, just I uh, just uh, when I research about this kind of uh, examples, uh, I look at uh, the this example in the paper, in the, my mm -hmm. my some interesting the research. The, the, this yes. research explained to the, the say that over over the case, the one just one of the the case, practical case, is uh, built in the Netherlands, just the Netherlands. Yes, no, no, no. I just wasn't sure if they have an example in Canada as well for something similar. Oh, uh, sorry. This. No, 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 Canada and no America, no USA. Okay. Sorry. North America, that. none of that. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, no, not, yeah. it's not here or in North, anywhere in North America. Yes, I think so. Okay. Okay. That's very interesting. Okay. Thank you, Dewu. Okay, well, thank you guys, um, and thank you for your questions for the class. Okay, um, so is there any other, yes, good presentation. Uh, is there any other questions um, for me, even, with regards to your project? No? Okay. So if not, uh, we're going to end today's class. I will let you guys go early today. Um, just keep working on your project. Keep working on your project. There is no BUD questions now. Erfin, you can message me. I'm going to be available. You're going to message me. Um, you can message. You can ask me the questions on uh, Teams. Not not right now. Just just message me on Teams, and I'll respond to you, Arifin. Okay. Um, that's for BUD, which is different. Oh, okay. So I'll check your email. Okay. Next, I am going to. So I'm going to end today's session. Um, thank you again for the group group four for your presentation. Very good, and. Um, you guys continue working on your project, please. Remember, it is due after the break, so you do have some time. But um, I just don't want you leaving it till the last minute. I want you guys to enjoy your study break. Take some time out for you and for uh, just relaxing a little bit if you do get a chance. And I know some of you are working on your ETR, so good luck with that. And uh, we will... Um, I will see you guys after the break. If you do have any questions throughout the break, please email me. I will try to respond. I am extremely busy during the break, but I am going to try to respond. It won't be as fast, but I will try to respond as soon as I can, okay? Have a good break, everybody. Bye.